Hello and welcome to this HDB webinar entitled Chemical Weed Control Options for Field Grown Ornamental Crops. I'm Wayne Bruff, HDB Ornamental uh, Exchange Knowledge Exchange Manager. We've got two speakers today. Uh, we've got David Talbot uh, covering uh, weed control in hardy, field grown hardy nursery stock. So David will be covering uh, weed control in tree and rose uh, production, general hardy nursery stock, seed beds, and herbaceous. Following David, we've got Chloe, who will be talking about weed control in field grown cut flowers. And again, uh, Chloe will be covering a number of crops, uh, uh, including Narcissus, Peony, Gladioli, and Sweet Williams. And as I say, each will be followed by five minutes of questions. For those who don't know David and Chloe, I'll just give a quick pot of history before I pass over to David uh, for the first presentation. Uh, David is a consultant with ADAS, having worked with ADAS for 13 years. He's been carry he carries out a mixture of grow consultancy and applied research. David previously worked quite closely with John Atwood, who was the weed control specialist uh, uh, for ADAS. Uh, and since John's retirement, he's, he's picked up his mantle and now leads the weed research in ornamental crops within ADAS. Chloe has also been working with ADAS for about the last seven years. Uh, the main focus of her work is on growing media, bedding and pot plants, hardy nursery stock, field grown cut flowers. Uh, she manages various herbicide trials on, on field grown cut flowers, both with ADAS and in collaboration with the Cut Flower Center. And she'll be sharing uh, most of the recent updates with us this morning. Welcome everyone. So an update on the week control options in field grown hardy nursery stock. So, a bit of an overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, some comments on contact herbicides, there's been some recent changes, and then some chemical weed control in various aspects of field production trees, roses, general field grown stock, feed bed production, and a little bit on field grown herbaceous. So, starting off with contact herbicides, the products we've left to work with have all have some limitations. Um, we recently lost Diquat, which was the useful product, um, so that's left us with fewer products. So now we have Shark, which is the AMU for use in the tree stock. Uh, it's a useful product, but it does have some gap weed control spectrum, like most of the contact herbs we have left to work with. So it's not very good on grasses, um, groundsel, and may weeds. Um, other products, contact products, include phenalisan, calc and gold, those are both pelagonic acid products and these are a newer product. Um, they've got quite a few requirements that growers really need to get right in order to get good results from them. So you need to be warm enough when you apply them over 50 degrees. Uh, weeds need to be as small as possible really. Generally with weeds, the smaller they are, the easier they are to kill. Um, so ideally less than 10 centimetres for these products and they need to be actively growing so the recent dry spell much of the country has had has meant that these products may not have worked very well for some people if you tried them um, so it's really getting everything together to make them work so if you are irrigating crops when you've irrigated get the products on after them when it's warm enough. They've got very detailed product labels and it's very well worth reading those because it's got advice for mixing them and agitating them to get the best results from them. So they're, they're products that need a bit more care and attention. They're not the sorts of things we can just whop in a spray tank and get a good result with without this care and attention and thinking about all these different aspects I've covered. Uh, and we've also got Dow Shield, uh, which is for pyrrolid. You need to avoid any drift or crop contact with this. Um, it's worse risk of damage when things are soft earlier in the year, it can cause a bit of leaf cuffing, and um, you can get some root uptake from it, particularly in maiden production. They're generally more susceptible to root uptake, particularly when you spot treating things like creeping thistle. Uh, another one we've got is Star Rain. High load HL, which is an EAMU, can volatilize, volatilize in hot weather, so that's something to think about when you apply it. Again, weeds need to be actively growing. This is a very useful product for taking out volunteer potatoes, which can be a problem in field production depending on previous rotations, but often potatoes feature in irrigated land where people are renting land um, to get around things like weed plants. 
Southfield also has an effect on volunteer behaviour potatoes, but it, I wouldn't say it's as good as styrene high load. It causes some stunting. It doesn't cause total desiccation of the, the leaf. It will stunt them and result in fewer daughter potatoes being produced, but they will still produce some. Um, so styrene is the product of choice for potatoes. Glyphosate, various products approved for in ornamentals, non-edible crops. One to be careful with, uh, rosaceous crops are very susceptible to it. Every year we have compensation claims where people spray it on arable crops and it drifts on to typically fruit propagators. Um, so they're rosaceae prop crops, things like raspberries. So you don't want to be using that in, in rosaceous crops and it can be damaging to other crops, but useful prior to planting, etc. So other contact herbicides we've got for grass control. We lost good old Aramo a few years ago. So Centurion Max has really become the product to replace that. It's been quite widely tested on a range of species. It seems to be pretty safe. You can get a little bit of scorching on soft growth, but crops generally quickly grow away from that. Um, so that's a useful product. Again, get the grass weeds when they're small, the smaller the better really. Um, and other products include Fuselade Max, Laser, which both have EMUs. Of course, good old glyphosate's a good product for grass control, um, but the same caveats to crop safety apply as covered previously. So moving on to chemical weed control in field tree production. This is an area where we've done quite a lot of research recently in the ongoing program of work on weed control funded by AHDB. So this table just gives the best treatment that growers can currently use for post-planting of dormant tree stocks. And you'll see we've got four products in there. Um, Sencrex Flow is something that came through in the EAMU relatively recently. It's widely used in potatoes. Um, we weren't sure how high a rate we could use. Um, and we've been looking at that as one of the aspects of this work, increasing the rate these are results from last year. I carried out the last score on final year's work of this trial um, last week, and we increased the rate of Sencrex up to 1.15 litres a hectare, which is the maximum rate. And I'm pleased to report we haven't seen any detrimental effects from that. So we didn't think we could get away with rates that high, so that's encouraging. Um, so those were products rates. After 12 weeks, we had just 2.3 percentage weed cover, um, which was very pleasing. As ever, we're looking at some experimental products. We're not really covering many of those in today's presentation because it, it doesn't really tell you much, but their products are further down the line that are coming. Um, there is one new active we're looking at that looks promising. And it's interesting to note that some of these experimental products in this trial did actually produce even better weed control than this 2.3 percent we're reporting here so there is a bit of positivity on the horizon um they're probably a couple of way years away as yet so moving on flexdoor springbok and benzar 500 performed well um gave us 2.3 percent weed control at two weeks um it was perhaps a little dry when that went on at that time of year but uh, as long as the crops hardened they seem safe on the crop so that's a useful mix there and then onto the post heading back treatments that went on early spring as soon as the crop was headed back while still dormant again a similar mix to the, the products going on post planting but again giving us good weed control at 12 weeks after treatment so thinking about rose production, another important field grown crop. So residual herbicides. So getting the herbicides on as soon as the dormant rose stocks are planted in the spring, planted out of cold stores so are getting off those on as quickly as you can before the crop starts moving. If they have started to move, you can expect a little bit of scorch, but the crop generally grows away from this without any problems. Sencrex flow, we're using lower rates for roses at present, but the work that's recently done on trees that I just covered may mean that 
those rates could be increased, but we haven't got any data to support that yet. So the rate for Sencrex is 0.73 litres per hectare on the stocks. Um, Stomp Aqua, the normal EAMU rate, Sunfire at 0.48 litres per hectare, that's the EAMU rate, and Venzo 500 SC Lenasil, which is at 0.4 litres per hectare. And that performs well, giving us good weed control and generally carries us quite well through to our residual next residual top up which goes on post budding later in the year so we're using metadachlor there and flexidor um, and also benzo 500. now flexidor has been some changes to the label that in recent years so now it's only one application per crop which is really a limitation but something we have to work with and in budded crops it seems most safe post budding we can use the other products like Sencrex when the crop's really dormant so that's the best place for it in programs in these sorts of crops so post heading back for these crops the following year in spring while well, still dormant getting the Sencrex flow on again also stomp aqua sunfire but here we're using a lower rate of Sencrex flow still because potentially you can get root uptake during that rapid growth in the maiden year, um, Sencrex can and does have the potential to move, although that may not be as serious as we thought, um, and using Stomp Aqua there at two litres, so slightly lower rate, and some fire at the EMU rate. So moving on into chemical control in field grown stock. So typically, most field grown stock gets herbicide after planting, or if it's a crop that's been carried over into its second year in the winter when it's still dormant. But these start to wane. Most residual herbicides typically last about 12 weeks. By about 12 weeks, most products will be fiddling out some a little bit before. So we've got fewer contact, reliable contact herbicides, as I just covered. But so we need to really make more use of residuals wherever we can. Um, and we've got dual gold, which came through under an EAMU a few years ago. And that's a useful top up application. It's a problem that we can only use it in May, but a problem we have to work with. Um, it's relatively persistent, but probably wouldn't last a full 12 weeks on its own. So there's been some interest lately in mixing dual gold with a product called well, active called Nica Sulfuron, which is Samson Extra, various products. But this product has a caveat that you need to apply it by mid June. But if you are applying it with dual gold, the dual gold caveat at the end of May overrules that. So you could put in with dual gold in May or follow up later in June to top up whichever suits. Um, some people have looked at putting these on as inter-row treatments where they, they have concerns over crop safety and that's a possibility. And depending on the density of the canopy of the crop may even get more of the active into where you want it. Ideally, applying them to moist soil. I know it can be a challenge at this time of year, but it's picking the day if you've got no irrigation and working with the weather, but this may make it quite challenging, that's for sure. So thinking about Samson Extra, Quite persistent, more so than dual gold. It broadens the weed control spectrum of dual gold, so worth worth tank mixing. It can be a little bit damaging, so as with any herbicide, if you're not familiar with it, it's worth carrying out trials on smaller areas of production before going ahead and treating your whole crop. So residual herbicides post budding. Just to recap, um, we're looking at Flexor and Sultan, Metasaclor, there are other products, Putan S, etc., or Flexidor and Springbok. Now, the beauty of Springbok, it gives improved control of cleavers, cranebill, poppy, and small nettles. So, if those weeds are a problem for you, that's one to definitely worth thinking about instead of traditional straight Metasaclor as Sultan or Putan S. So, moving on to seed beds. Um, a lot of work was done on this a few years ago in a project called HNS 155, 
um, these are the pre-emergence residual herbicides that prove effective and safe. Um, lots of ones we've already talked about there. Uh, <coughs> we looked at a range of species in this trial, so it's too much in the trial to cover and to give you exact rates, but a report has got some very useful tables in, and that's worth getting hold of if you're interested in treating seed beds. Just a note on Centium, it, Clomazone, it can and often does cause some transient yellowing, but the crop grows away from this without any trouble after a number of weeks. Uh, dual gold, may only, we looked at. Um, just a point on dual gold in these trials, we haven't got the current EAMU, so the rate is slightly higher in the report than is on the EAMU, but you must not use that high rate. Um, use the rate on the EAMU, which is 0.78 litres per hectare. Uh, Goltix WG and Goltix 70SC. Um, Goltix WG is authorised under the LTA EU, but it's not currently marketed as far as I'm aware. So if you've got a bit in your stores, that can be used up. But Goltix 70SC has got an EAMU, which is a useful development. Now, just on Goltix, the the two products there are exactly the same concentration, so it's just a name change. But it's worth noting that some of the species were treated with rates of up to three litres per hectare in these trials with Goltix WG, but the Goltix 70 SCEMU, which is the one we're working with going forward, has a maximum rate of two litres per hectare as a single application, so slightly lower rate there. A springbok we also looked at. So looking at those products alone, as with most herbicides, get some gaps in the weed control spectrum. So Stomp Aqua plus one or more of the above gives improved weed control and was safe for some species. And again, that information is detailed within those tables in that report. So post-emergence herbicides for seed beds. Again, this was looked at in the same project. Centium also produced some transient yellowing. It's gone the AMU. It's useful to note that the AMU restricts use on up to six leaves post-emergent, post-emergent. So that's gives you an idea of timing when you'd need to get it on by. Something we have to work with. Um, dual gold, same comment about the rates there. Um, it's a slightly lower rate under the EMU than was looked at in the trials. We haven't got the EMU at that point, so we were kind of guessing a bit at the rate and using the best knowledge we had at the time. Same comments as covered on Goltix, Goltix 70SC, and also Springbok. So, some post emergence weed control of seedling weeds. Some general comments there. Um, say your herbicides haven't performed very well because they went on in slightly too dry conditions. Uh, and Madifan is a good product to use. Got available as bestimal flow, causal SC. Um, control small weeds, seedlings are in the crop. It can cause a little yellowing on the crop, but they generally grow away from that without any bother. And depending on the product, up to two to three applications. So, dormant season treatments, we're working with Stomp Aqua, Stomp Aqua and Springbok, and Flexidor alone or in mixtures where you haven't used it at another time of year, or Sencrex Flow. Um, just a point on Sencrex Flow, it can be a little bit damaging, and we talked about some of the slightly more cautious rates on roses in particular, but a good approach where the dog used for some of the growers I work with is increasing the rate gradually, say by 10%, stepping that up each year. And if you do get a bit of damage, you can, it's not catastrophic. You can say, I'm happy with that, we'll go a bit more next year. Um, it's always a balance with residual herbicides, particularly some such as Sencorex, between Ancentium and leaf yellowing are covered, between a little bit of crop damage and getting good weed control. Um, 
a little bit of crop damage. It doesn't always look that pretty, but as long as the crop grows away from it, you don't necessarily need to worry about it. And hand lay, hand weeding is getting increasingly expensive. Um, labour concerns going forward, so um, it's worth accepting a little damage if it gives you improved weed control. So moving on to chemical weed control in field-grown herbaceous. Uh, current herbicides for use over the crop, we've got Devrinol, um, and that's recently come back under EAMU. It does have a caveat but it can only be used between 1st of November and the end of February. And I suspect that's because it degrades rapidly in bright sunlight, but we can still get bright days at that time of year. So anyone using Devranol at that time of year, it's worth noting that it doesn't want to be applied on a bright day. Benzar 500 SC, Glenacil, rate of 0.4 litres a hectare. Good old Flexor, once per crop again. Dual gold in May and Star Wars is met as a claw. Just a note on met as a claw. <coughs> There's a maximum legal rate of 1.5 litres a hectare a year. Um, sorry, yes, and that gives 750 grams per year. Now we can't apply more than 1,000 grams in three years. So if you are using that 1.5 litre rate, it's fine in a crop rotation if you're not going to go back in the product. If you're wanting to use it annually, you have to use a lower rate as there, which gives you uh, 333 grams a year, which keeps everything legal. That's me done. I hope that's provided some useful information for everyone and uh, would welcome any questions that people have. Thank you, David. Uh, we've had uh, one or two uh, people submit questions. First one I've got here is, is there likely to be a replacement for Sumimax after heading back? Seems we are going to be uh, doing away with, with an application. Um, unfortunately not at the moment. It was a very useful herbicide. There have been supply issues with it for two or three years and people have been struggling to get it. So those that had some in store were okay. Um, but no, sadly not. Um, it's it's a useful product we've lost. It's the same general trend, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. We are, we are struggling also for weed control on, on container ground crop and, and having to resort to physical weed control methods like pot toppers and loose mulches. What's going to be the situation with field ground crops? Has, has anything been locked up there in terms of physical weed control? Um, I have had a grower that has had a look at using some bark um, in field grown production, obviously quite a high cost, um, but they didn't have very pleasing results and it's not something they've continued with. Um, that was a one off and it would need to be looked at again, perhaps, but um, it's certainly a challenge. Um, there are, interestingly, some paper, there's a paper mulch recently become available from Ger in Germany. Um, but it's been used in organic production um, out, out in Germany, I believe, and it seems to last quite well, so that might be something to think about. Um, there are people planted through plastic as an alternative to herbicides, but plastics are under a cosh, and then you've got the disposal cost of getting rid of them, so that's sort of where we are, really. Okay, thank you. Uh... Again, coming back to containerized rather than field grown, got a question here about uh, what can be used to control eradicate willow herb in containerized trees, pre-emergence and post-emergence? So if they're in containerized trees, um, you could always put some, uh, presume, assuming that the stem is lignified, you could always put the uh, contact herbicide on to kill those out such as shark to, to take them out, save the physical hand weeding, um, assuming there's no leaf down that it's going to catch it. Um, that's the useful option in winter. You may want to add a wetter to improve its fixing. Uh, and then residual wise, we have got Devrinol, so that's come back. So that's a useful one against as a winter treatment against, against willow herb. 
Okay, thank you. We we did more more of a oh uh, we've got a, well it's, it's more of a statement here rather than a question. I, th I think backing up what you just said, shark is very good at controlling emerged willow herb. I, I presume you yeah. you, you, you yes, agree yes, with that? Right. Yeah. yeah, it won't have any residual effects whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any any sort of comments about Finelson? There's there's a comment here about it. Uh, uh, it's, it's expensive and, and not particularly cost effective on large areas. Is, is, do, you, do you find that are alternatives perhaps? <laughs> yes, it is expensive, but um, it's sadly one of a few, few tools in the box. Um, I haven't done any calculations on the cost of it versus hand, hand weeding, but I surmise it's still significantly cheaper than hand weeding. So you always want to be avoiding any hand weeding. That's the, the ultimate goal, really. Or reducing it to an absolute minimum. Okay. I mean, it's not uncommon these days for people to spend tens of thousands on hand weaving, particularly on a large to what well, reasonable to large scale. Yeah. Um, any experience on field grown conifers to weed control over the crop? It's not something we've done a lot of work on um, recently. Um, So I'd have to come back on that one. Um, could we put a few notes out to delegates, Wayne? Uh, yeah, yeah. We 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 can sort that out. Or, or we I I can I've got I've got the person who submitted the question. I I I can sort of submit that to you directly, and you, you can sort that out uh, afterwards if if need be. That'd be great. Uh, can I can I ask about? Uh, I, I know you didn't want to sort of say too much about the code of products because it's it's difficult because we, we we don't know what the future of them will be exactly and 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 the, and the time scales. But from from the ones you've been looking at, is 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 the future rosy in terms of the potential for some of them coming through? Hopefully, um, there's one that's looking promising. That's uh, hopefully only a, a couple of years away, um, which is. It's nice to have something on the horizon, to be honest. Um, can't say too much because we're bound by confidentiality by the, the company behind it that uh, uh, are working on it. So they're working hard to get it through, obviously. So there's a gap in the market for the new products. So, um, yeah, hopefully watch this space and we'll have something in a year or two. And then that's when the real beauty of the coded work comes through because growers can be told product code in the trials and you can look back and you can see that the work's already been done so hopefully as soon as the product comes through you can pick it up and work with it so okay uh again i think rather like the uh, the field grown conifers you you may want to defer this one but uh a question here about weed controlling christmas trees and any any uh, updates there yes yeah, so people are using they are using Syncrex in those, um, also Flexidor, things like Gold Ticks. Um, it's like most crops, it's not that easy to build a program. And um, also worth having a look at dual gold in them and possibly the Samson Extra that I've talked about to give some summer weed control. Um, not all of those would necessarily want to go over a crop, some might be better as an inter row application but that's not easy in more mature plantations um so that's yeah there's, there's certainly products there okay thank you for that and then, and, I, sorry can i just add when yeah. glyphosate is also used in the winter as well in christmas trees and it, when they're waxed up it's it's safe so okay so you need to use the the older formulations without the wetters the non-bioactive types a couple of quick ones just to finish then uh have, have you looked at the crop safety in asters with the products you have used in trials uh, not as far as i'm aware um i'll double check and we'll put that in the notes okay and again uh coming back to christmas trees have, have you have you tried have you considered uh, i think it should be shikara in, in christmas trees um no um because it's not legal, basically, it is only used in non-cropped areas. Um, people are using it, and they shouldn't be. Um, but it it can turn things very yellow because it can move down the soil profile in wet conditions. So 
it is a very risky strategy and obviously one that we can't condone at the moment. We'd love to get an EAMU for it and look at it at perhaps lower rates, but um, to date that hasn't been possible. Sadly. Okay. Okay. Uh, just looking at the time. Okay. What well, one more then? Um, not quite a herbicide, more of a soil disinfectant. But any any update on basimid? It's sort of hanging in there, really. It's I believe emergency approval at the moment. Um, I don't think we're going to have it long term, um, which is again going to make life harder. Um, it, not only for nursery stock, but for fruit world as well. So. Um, yeah, persistent soil sterilizers, persistent herbicides are under the caution. I hope I hope I'm wrong, but um, I can't see it being there for that many years. I think I, I think know, you're right. Company, I think you're right, David. I've been I've been being sorry. The companies behind it are very working very hard to support it and keep it there. It's, it's obviously a big product for them, but um, that's a state of play, I'm afraid. Yes. I've having been working behind the scenes with uh, Ballette, our crop protection officer on this. Uh, we, we've been trying to put a robust case to maintain basimid uh, for the foreseeable future. But I think I agree with, with you, David, on that one. I think um, it's, it's probably just going to be a matter of time now, unfortunately, with, with that. Um, so if, if I can draw that session to a conclusion there, because we've just, just about exactly on time now. And if I can pass over to uh, to Chloe for our second presentation. So, David, if you wouldn't mind muting and just closing your webcam, and I shall pass over to, to Chloe Whiteside for the presentation on weed controlling cut flowers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wayne. So I can see my presentation. Hopefully everyone else can now see my presentation and hear me and see me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you this morning about chemical weed control options for field grown cut flowers. Uh, the structure of my talk, I just want to um, talk a little bit about uh, the background. Um, so the kind of current situation where we're at in terms of herbicides for field grown cut flowers. Um, and then as Wayne mentioned in the introduction, the four crops that I'm going to focus on are Narcissus, Peony, Gladioli and Sweet Williams. Um, the reason for this being that obviously there are a whole range of different crops that we could talk about, um, but these are four where there have been a lot of work done over the last few years. Um, there's been some new products come forwards, so there's a lot more information to share um, about trials that have been done and ones that are also uh, still ongoing at the moment. Um, so as we know, cut flowers are a very high value horticultural product. However, there are actually very few specific label approvals for the use of herbicides in cut flower production. Generally, from a commercial perspective, the market for herbicides and ornamentals is seen as very small uh, and the risks too great for new product development. So really, we have to rely on products which are already authorised and have label approval on crops such as uh, field vegetables or some arable products. Um, and then we have to look at getting an extension of that authorization for use within ornamentals. Um, the difficulty is also greater because we have such a wide range of genera grown, each with their own herbicide sensitivities. So products that may be perfectly safe on some crops, you just can't use on others. So it's really difficult to try and find which are the most useful products and which are the most useful rates. Um, so there's a lot more work involved in having to kind of find how to get the most out of these products that we have available to us. Obviously, weed growth impacts on yield and the quality of your crop. And it also makes things like stem picking a lot harder if you've got a lot of weeds there as well. Um, so therefore, that's increasing your labour costs and your time. Um, and we also have the issue of uh, weeds encouraging pests and diseases into your crop. So if you can keep on top of your weeds right from the outset, then you have a better chance of keeping pests and diseases at bay as well. And as I mentioned, in order to do this, we need to be looking at the new and existing products already out there um, for their efficacy and safety on field grown cut flowers. So I'm going to start with Narcissus first um, and kind of look at the current situation in terms of uh, pre-emergence control. So what we have on here in this table, a list of products um, 
Nineron is no longer approved, some of you will be very familiar with that. Um, we have products on here which are useful, but some of them are kind of limited in their control options. Um, some products were seen as the rate of approval may be too low to give us the kind of uh, persistence that we need. Um, so things like metazoclor, uh, dimethylpine and metazoclor, so butazan, springbok. Um, other products like chlorprofam, pendimethylin, flufenacet, very good products, but all have uh, limitations to their control. So, for example, chlorprofam actually works a lot better in cooler and damper conditions as opposed to warm and dry. And obviously, with kind of the seasons that we experience um, and the way that you know, uh, spring has been over the last couple of years, um, that's going to have a knock on effect onto how long uh, products like chlorprofam persist for. Uh, Pendimethylin, Stomp Aqua, a very good product, has a broad range of uh, weeds that it controls, but there are a few key weeds in there, such as uh, groundsel, which it just doesn't give it control on. So there are gaps in some of these products, um, and some of them they just don't really give the persistence um, that we would require. So it's in Correct's Flow, for example. Um, so you may think of tank mixing that with uh, something like uh, Sunflyer to, to give you uh, better improved control. So some work has been carried out over the last few years by AIDAS with AHDB. Um, so this is some of the work that my colleagues Angela Huckle and Emily Lawrence were looking at, uh, looking at dormant trial actives in 2017 to 18. Um, I have listed some of the coded products on here, which I appreciate doesn't really mean much, very, uh, mean much at the moment. Um, but what we can say is that some of these products on here, like the 9987, uh, that's seen as giving very good control for willow herb and groundsel and is one of these products that we're hoping is going to come to market soon. Um, by soon, I mean in the next couple of years. Um, but it has come up a lot in various trials work and has given us uh, good results. Um, so that's a product that is looking promising. Uh, also, at the time, metabromeron was a experimental active, but we have since uh, been given authorization um, through an EMU for the use of metabromeron in outdoor ornamental plant production on bulbs. Um, so a range of different experimental actives and then also approved actives in their chromosome, chlorprotherm, pendimethylin, metribuzin. So we get that wide range of uh, weed control uh, that we're looking at in this dormancy trial. One thing to note, however, on the chlorprofam, um, we are due to lose that towards the end of this year. So October 2020, um, that's up for expiry. Um, so in terms of the trial timeline, so this is going back to 2017, the field planted in August, uh, treatment applications in the dormancy period in November, a few little top up treatments at early leaf emergence in January, and then weed assessments, phytotoxicity and flower assessments as well. So leaving the crop in the ground rather than picking um, so that we can look at any uh, effects that the, the products may have on the actual flowers themselves as well. Generally speaking, we didn't see much at all in the way of phytotoxicity from the various products, um, whether they were approved, uh, applied alone or in tank mixes. Um, and so you can see a shot here from February of the trial area where really nice, clean looking crop, very few weeds. And as I say, very little phytotoxicity. So maybe a very slight amount of damage on a couple of leaf uh, tips, but nothing that would make the crop unmarketable. Um, one thing that we did see, it was just from this treatment. Um, so this was Sencorex plus Stomp applied in the November dormancy period. And then this coded product, which was made at very leaf, uh, early leaf emergence in January. Um, so as opposed to seeing nice straight stems, we were seeing, uh, seeing some twisting and distortion um, from this product, but nothing else from any of the other actives that we were applying. So the summary from that trial was really that uh, in terms of efficacy, products were very good. We were seeing very few weeds and all except for that 9921 were looking promising to take forward. And as I mentioned previously, we have since had an EMU application approved and got the metabromeron product um, for use on bulbs. So just a note on the metabromeron products, it does uh, 
come under four different names of there's four different metabomorin products out there uh, Inigo, Lianto, Praxin and Soleto um, but they are all the same thing um, so they're all 500 grams a litre of active ingredient metabromorin all a maximum individual dose of two litres a hectare with one treatment per year and it must be applied between 1st of September and 1st of December so four different product names but they are uh, in, in effect the same thing We've also looked at some post-cropping work. Um, so this was a uh, follow-up from the dormancy. So this was in 2018 to 19. Um, post-cropping uh, weed, uh, weed treatments, it is important um, because obviously if you think when people go through and you're picking the crop and harvesting the crop, that's disturbing the, the soil layer and the herbicide kind of seal, um, which uh, then will allow new weeds to germinate. Um, and in some cases we've seen where actually if you don't keep control in control of the weeds at the post cropping stage, then that can have knock on effects for the, the yields the following year. Um, and in some cases up to 25 percent reduce yields because of the weed control um, at that post cropping stage. So it is important um, to be looking at this stage of production as well. So you can see we've walked through a couple of those promising experimental treatments. So again, the 9987, that's the one that we're um, going through the authorization process at the moment. And then a list of approved actives um, that give us a wide range of weed control. Um, so Sentium, Stomp Aqua, uh, Buttery Flow, Wing P and Curb Flow. Lecter was in there as well. Um, and I have a question mark over the uh, the availability of lecture at the moment and whether or not that's still authorised and if uh, that's coming back or not. So that's a slight uncertainty at the moment. So again, this is post cropping trial. So the spray application went on in March um, with weed and phytotoxicity assessments after that. And then right up until November, um, we just put on the grower standard treatment in November to, just to keep weeds at bay up until the flowering period. So then we could look at any effects on flowering as well. So this is just a little snapshot of what we were seeing. Um, so we've got Curb Flow and Stomp Aqua, the grower standard on your left. And then this is this coded product again, this 9921. So this is the one where we saw these twisting stems in the dormancy trial. And what you can see here is just a complete lack, uh, loss of leaf turga. Um, and whereas you can see some buds forming in the grower standard treatment, there's really not a lot to see at the moment in this 9921. So that, that product's not really looking very promising, but everything else is giving us very good, good results. Um, again, we saw very few weeds and all product appeared in, uh, commercially acceptable with the exception of this one coded active. That brings us on to the most recent work where we're uh, looking at dormancy again since so 2019 to 2020. So literally just, just finished this piece of work. More experimental actives um, because actually there's kind of more things coming through that are um, important for us to look at. Um, and then a range of approved actives as well. So really kind of trying to spread the uh, the amount of uh, different products that we can look at um, and look at in this dormancy period. And obviously now we've got metabromium in there um, as an approved active. So that comes under the, the Praxin name there. So this was an application of treatments in November of 2019, followed by a few treatments in January and weed assessments, phytotoxicity assessments and flower assessments at the end of the trial, so in March of this year. Um, that's a project or piece of work which is still in the um, reporting stage, so the, the, the results have not yet been um, released um, and the report's not yet available, it should be available at the towards the end of this year. But what we can say is that we have seen very few weeds again from this dormancy trial um, and everything that we tested, including the uh, coded products, appeared to be safe. So we've got some really promising things coming through in terms of um, Narcissus weed control. So I've just summarised some of that information into 
uh, growers' suggestions for applications in the dormant period in November and then the post-cropping period in March. I won't read this all out to you because you can probably read it quicker than I can read it out. Um, but as you can see, we've got um, some key products in there for the dormancy period, so the Stomp Aqua uh, with Senkorex or also with the addition of Centium in there as well, so the, the Clomazone. Uh, in terms of post-cropping, where we have Curb Flow and Stomp Aqua, I have also then listed Curb and the Stomp Aqua and this coded product, which uh, I appreciate it's not available right now, but it is one that has given us very good control um, and is proved to be safe. And it is one that we're confident we're going to have uh, come through uh, quite, quite soon. So having that on there just kind of gives you confidence in that there are more things coming forward. Um, and as David alluded to before, you know, there are, there are some uh, promising things on the horizon. Um, then we've also got things in there like buttery flow and stomp aqua either alone or again, uh, control is improved with the addition of this coded product uh, and then wing pea and sentium as well. So there are, there are um, options um, and different products that you can be using to give you uh, a wide range of weed control um, with the crop safety as well. So now I want to move on to Peony um, and some work which is currently being done by Lyndon Mason at the National Cut Flower Centre. So Peony is a crop where there hasn't actually been a lot of work done over recent years, um, but they have had the opportunity to do some work this year. Uh, in terms of the current situation for Peony, generally it's uh, pendimethylin and metribuzin at the pre-emergent stage, and then on the de uh, dormant crop, lenosyl and isoxaben. Um, again, these products, they are good, but they have some limitations to them. Um, Senkorex flow, for example, metribuzin, on very light or sandy soils, it does have the potential to be damaging um, as a result of leaching. Uh, in the dormancy period with the Benzar, we are now limited to an application of 0.4 litres a hectare, but you can repeat that up to a total of one litre a hectare. So you could do top up treatments of Benzar um, as directed sprays into row during the growing season and the, the crop would be tolerant of that. Um, and the crop was also tolerant of uh, Dow Shield at 0.5 litres a hectare, again, as a directed spray in the growing season for thistle control. But really, that's kind of where we are with peonies at the moment, with those few products available to us. Um, so what they are doing at the, the Cut Flower Centre this year, uh, they have a crop of peony, which was planted last year. The area was sprayed off with Phenosan in early Feb, just to kind of clean the area up. Uh, and then they're looking at four different actives. So um, three of these are approved. So we've got a uh, hurricane, stomp and sunfire, and then uh, one coded product in there as well, uh, which again is one that we are hoping will, um, will be coming through to market uh, in the ornamental sector in the next couple of years. Uh, and they're also looking at different varieties because sometimes obviously you can get uh, different susceptibilities to herbicide damage depending on the variety. So this is work in progress at the moment, just to show you that the treatments went on uh, in early March, so just after the phenol sand treatment was applied. Um, and then they've been looking at weeds and phytotoxicity and the trial is still in the ground at the moment. Oops. In terms of results so far, so this is the variety Coral Charm um, and we've got the coded product on the left and then we've got Hurricane and Stomp. And we are seeing uh, some phytotoxicity effects on these uh, on this variety. So you can see the kind of uh, pink in discoloration to the leaf edges and then also with the, uh, the picture on the right where that's kind of spreading into the leaf as well. Um, and also some uh, distortion and a bit of um, twisting to the, to, the, to the leaves as well there. Now, it is worth pointing out that when the treatments were applied, the coral charm was already actually just poking above the surface. Um, so in effect, these almost went on, these treatments almost went on as a post-emergence um, treatment. So you can see that obviously that's causing damage. You wouldn't um, therefore expect to 
say that these could go on as a post-emergent treatment, but it's worth bearing that in mind that because of weather conditions at the time, these ones were already poking through the surface when the, when the treatments were applied. Um, but there's also the, the fact that this phenol sand went on as well in late February, so there could also be a relationship between the products there as well. That can't be ruled out. Um, but there are there are damage um, there is damage occurring from all of the treatments on the on the coral charm. If you look at other varieties, um, so this is Hurricane and Stomp Aqua again on a different variety, um, and you can see that there is a very small amount of uh, pinking on some of the leaves um, but it's not as severe as what we've seen in the coral charm um, and you haven't really got the leaf distortion and twisting that we saw in the previous pictures so in terms of uh, kind of results and going forward they are seeing some promising results at the moment um, with in terms of certain actives on peony but it's too early to really be giving any concrete um, recommendations. Um, so realistically, work would need to continue for another year and probably different weather conditions as well. So then we could really look at uh, the rates and what is safe and what isn't. So that's work in progress um, and will continue. And then we now look at gladioli. So again, this is a crop where there hadn't really been done uh, much work done um, for a few years. Um, so last year, uh, as part of the Sector Plus project, we did look at a range of trial actives on a crop of gladioli in Kings Lynn. Uh, again, experimental actives in there, as well as things that are already approved. Um, so we were just looking at products on their own rather than in tank mixes. Um, and then we've got this experimental product of 9900, where we just looked at two rates um, just to see whether there was risk with the higher rate of phytotoxicity. Um, so, again, all of these products were applied on their own and they were all applied over, over the crop rows as opposed to into row. So we had our field planted in May and then the application of the treatments in June. So... Um, probably about two weeks after application was when the, the crop began to emerge and we could look at weeds and phytotoxicity from June, July and August. And then in September, when flowers started to emerge, uh, then we could look at any effect on flowering as well. So basically what we were seeing was good weed control, but crucially no phytotoxicity from any of the treatments that we applied. Um, so even with the coded products and that one product where we looked at the high rate and the lower rate, even with the higher rate, we weren't seeing any issues. And you can see from the colours of the flowers, we didn't see any, uh, any damage to the flowers or any discoloration or faded um, flower blooms either. So really quite promising um, results from that trial. So we're seeing good weed control. All treatments appeared to be safe. Um, from that, suggestions for application prior to crop emergence, we used Sencorex at 0.75 litres a hectare, Wing P at 3.5, Sunfire at 0.48 litres and Springbok at 2.5. So they all gave us good control and were safe um, at those rates when applied pre-emergence. Um, but bear in mind that we didn't look at tank mixes. So something like Sunfire is primarily for grass control. It will give a little bit of broadleaf uh, weed control as well, um, but primarily for grasses. So you may um, wish to mix that in with something else. And that's not something that we looked at in terms of crop safety. So it would be a tank mix at your own risk that you'd probably want to test prior to wide scale use. Um, and we always say that, you know, if you're going to use uh, products and rates that have come from trials, it's always best to test it yourself first because we are doing this trial in one year in one particular set of weather conditions and on a particular soil type. Um, and things can be slightly different year on year, depending on the weather. Um, so just that caveat in there that testing products first is always, always a sensible thing to do. Uh, the metabromeron was also safe and the coded products were safe. So that really helps us in kind of building the case for bringing these new products forward and getting them onto the market. 
Um, as I said, we didn't look at tank mixes. Uh, and finally for Sweet Williams, so uh, some work was done with ADAS and the Cut Flower Centre back in 2014 and 2015. Um, from that, we kind of have this um, uh, these suggestions here or these recommendations um, for products that can be used safely on sweet williams um, because sweet williams notoriously is quite a sensitive crop um, so not a, an awful lot that can be used on them um, so in terms of pre-emergence generally stomp aqua and gold ticks at lower rates so 0.75 stomp aqua one liter a hectare for gold ticks uh, is generally what's commercially used for pre-emergence of sweet williams. There are then some products that can be applied uh, at the four leaf stage, so some top-up treatments. Um, so we've got Butazan, Springbok, Venzar, and Shark. Um, so I'll come back to Shark in a moment, um, but these are things that our uh, sweet williams are tolerant of at that four leaf stage just to give you a bit more ongoing persistence. Um, and then in terms of a dormant crop, then we've got uh, Devonol and Flexidor um, that we can use. Um, so in terms of the shark, uh, that's something that we looked at at the cut flower center. Um, obviously it's contact acting only, no residual effect, but good at getting rid of any of those uh, kind of stubborn weeds that you don't really want to be there. Um, so this picture just shows the effect of uh, when we applied shark on sweet williams. So you can see the picture on the left. This is 11 days after treatment and it really did look quite severe um, with really bleaching of the leaves there and damage to the crop. Not something that you would probably be too keen to see. But if you then look at six weeks after treatment, the crop grew through it absolutely fine and there was no damage and there was no long lasting effect um, because obviously it's purely contact. So it had scorched those bits that it touched, but then the knock on effect was that the remainder of the crop grew through nice and clean. Um, and just kind of linking back a bit to what David mentioned, if you can tolerate a bit of crop damage earlier on, then as long as the plants or the crop grow out of it, then, then it is worth considering. Um, so Sweet Williams will be tolerant of, of shark and will grow away from that damage. So what we're actually doing some work this year, um, again through Sceptre Plus, um, we're looking at some experimental actives again, um, but also some approved actives. Um, so Stomp, Defy and Springbok, we did look at them all in quite great detail at the Comp Cut Flower Centre a few years ago. Um, but now we're looking at whether we can actually apply products between the rows rather than over the over the crop um, and therefore get away with using higher rates of active. So therefore, you should, in theory, get better persistence um, from your residuals and better weed control. Um, but your effect of uh, your risk of phytotoxicity on the crop is reduced because we've gone into row um, rather than over. Um, so precision spraying and into row spraying is something that we're seeing more and more of um, in particularly field grown vegetables. Um, and it is something that is done uh, in ornamentals. But I think maybe going forwards um, is something that we might need to kind of focus on a bit more. Um, so this is some work that is due to start really in the next week or so um, over towards Spalding Way. Um, and yeah, we will be looking um, at the effect of using precision sprays with the Allium Nebraska Centre. Um, so that's really much uh, work in progress. Um, that brings me to the end of my talk and um, happy to take questions Wayne yeah we we've got a couple of questions and also just a comment if I start with a comment uh, mm. boxer is still available in place of lector uh, so there is an option there if you want to use that particular active ingredient I gather okay yeah I would just have to, when I looked up for lector a couple of days ago it wasn't showing on the the list of approved products anymore um, but if there are alternatives still then yeah by all means 
Okay, a um, couple of questions. The first relating to peonies, uh, has there been any work on Goltex Titan? Um, pass. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, all I'm aware of, obviously, is at the moment what's been uh, going on at the, the, the Cut Flower Centre with Linden. Um, so he may perhaps, know more. Perhaps, perhaps it's one to add to the list, if not, for, for future treatments. Yeah. Uh, another one, uh, oh, Gladioli. I understand they use dual gold on Gladioli in Belgium. Have you looked at this product? Um, we didn't look at that product. Um, I mean, part of it is because of the, the restriction with just that, that May application. Um, and we were trying to look at things that aren't quite so quite so restrictive um, hence why we had a range of different products and the coded products in there um, so it's not something that we looked at in that trial um, whether or not other growers have used it in the past I'm not too sure um, okay so uh a comment from Joe, who's, who's the ornamental crop protection officer with the HDB. Uh, just to note that there is no emu for metabromuron for cut flowers yet, only bulbs. We, no. We're currently work, working on it. So it's just a little footnote there just to remind people. Yes, um, I should have highlighted that when I gave my talk. I've got metabromuron listed in my experimentals for the thing. I should have highlighted the bulbs. Okay. And, and one last question as I, I look at the time, it's, it's been now five minutes uh, over. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether you can answer this because it's not one of the crops you mentioned to, today, but any information on products suitable for weed control over field grown seedling wallflowers? Um, we did do some work at the Cut Flower Centre again back in 2014 and 15 on wallflowers. And from the top of my head, I can't think right now of. Um, uh what we found in that but it's something that i could look into um can i also just i forgot to mention this as well wayne the i don't know if you can see this this fact sheet chemical weed control in outdoor cut flower crops um i just wanted to highlight that as something that is quite useful um for a bit of information but bearing in mind it was written in 2017 so some of it is now a bit dated but there's a lot of different crops in here both drilled and transplanted um, which will give you some information and then if you work with your um, advisor or your agronomist then they can help you kind of build on on that so that's quite a useful fact sheet but okay. I could find out about all flowers as well okay thank you Chloe just just to remind people the fact sheet is chemical weed control in outdoor cut flower crops and the number is 0217 that that yeah. should be available on our website if you wish to download it
don't forget to complete or submit the basis and there are also forms as required. As I said, they're, they're available in the, the handout box in, in, in the menu to the right hand side of your screen. Any further questions, please submit them to me and I'll pass them on to the presenter uh, over the next couple of days if, if, if you haven't thought of anything or something springs to mind, perhaps later this afternoon. And as I say, the recording will be made available next week uh, on the HDB uh, website. The, the link is, is, is there if you want to make a note of it. And please look out for future HDB Horticulture webinars. We, we have a series planned throughout the upcoming months. Uh, we are starting a monthly webinar uh, of various topics the last Thursday evening of, of, of each month. So that will be a, a regular uh, format there for you to keep an eye on. It just, it just just to sort of say thank you all for joining us today for this webinar and good luck with your weed control programs during the, during the coming season. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne.